Wait, stop the music. I'm sorry everyone to interrupt before the show's even got started, but I realised that after editing the show I missed out some of the things I meant to say. And anyway, I thought it might be nice to just say hello to everyone and explain why the show sounds like it does this week, this month, whatever. Basically, because of coronavirus, we are all stuck at home and not able to get together around the table like we normally do for the podcast. So, as most people are doing, we've done it remotely. And it seems to work all right. I think we've learned some things that if we need to do the next one remotely, we can make it a little better sounding. But I think it it went okay. so I hope you enjoy that anyway. And I'd like to also say that if you just want to chat while... While this is all going on, then obviously we're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram at Hark87 Podcast everywhere or Hark87 Podcast at gmail.com if you want to direct messages or anything like that. We're always happy to uh, respond. And yeah, I hope you're all doing well in these very strange times. But back to ghosts. I think doing the podcast over the strange new system that we did it led me to get a little bit muddled in my going down my list. So I missed some things out that I meant to say. So I'll just fill you in on those before I actually give you the podcast proper. So, for instance, what I didn't tell you was the book was dedicated to Ed Victor. And I do like to find out about who these dedicatees are, if I can. And Ed Victor was very easy to find out about. And you possibly know him and know more about him than I do. But he was an American literary agent who was mainly based in London. He was from a Bronx background. So he was from a a sort of a Russian family background in the way that Evan Hunter was from an Italian family background. So they clearly knew each other. There's correspondence between them in Evan Hunter's records. I don't actually know whether Ed Victor was ever... A representative of Evan Hunter. I can't find that information. If you know it, please do let me know. But I think Ed Victor's a fascinating character. He, I mean, died in 2017. But in, this sums him up a little bit. In 2003, uh, Victor and his wife were named second on Tatler's list of the most invited guests in London, behind Elton John. So he wasn't just a well-known literary agent, he was a very well-known person. And apparently he was very, very well thought of in the industry, and he represented loads of famous names, and quite a few estates as well. So he like managed the estate of Raymond Chandler. If I have a quick look through the list of some of the names that he was associated with, he's looking after, he was looking after the estate of Douglas Adams. Who else have we got? Eric Clapton. Mel Brooks. Oh, there's all sorts of names here. Julian Glover. Oh, excellent. Nigella Lawson. I, the estate of Iris Murdoch. Pamela Stevenson. You too. Gosh, there's all sorts here. So, yeah, apparently he was a very nice guy, very social. And I can understand from everything I've read why he would be friends with Evan Hunter and why he'd get a dedication. So that's something I meant to mention, Ed Victor, the dedication. And what I also forgot to mention was some of the contemporary reviews of the time, which, of course, includes something from the New York Times by Newgate Calendar. So I haven't got Morgan here to do the voice. Um, He's his usual self. In Ghosts, Ed McBain supplies another adventure of his 87th Precinct Boys. There are two murders in an apartment house around Christmas time. There is also a medium, some kinky sex and even ghosts. Kinky sex is pushing it a bit. What is it that Sergeant Corella saw? Well, he got that wrong because he's not a sergeant for a start. So, blah to you, Calendar. That will forever remain a secret. Also, to remain a secret is how Jennifer Grote can lisp the word party and the name Danny. So, he's picked on a couple of things there and just got it wrong. He hasn't actually reviewed that there or given an opinion, just being a bit snidey, as usual. Crime Ration by Christopher Wordsworth in The Observer. Spectral red herrings nicely marinated in parapsychology. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, this is good. With pulchritudinous medium in tow, did tough tender cop Corella only dream that visitation by a succubus? Case filleted with usual procedural know-how. So he's not particularly landed on one opinion or another. A review by HRF Keating in the Times. Ghosts by Ed McBain. More substantial 87th Precinct tale than usual, both size-wise, brackets, oops, and in substance, with exploration of the occult, slips down like ectoplasm, of course. Now, I think that's a good review. I don't know what the oops after size-wise is about, but there you go. 
Jean M. White talking about the book in her mysteries column in the Washington Post. Let's have a little look. Can you imagine Steve Carella, the hard-nosed cop, experienced in the routine of tracking down criminals in a grimy big city, going off with a psychic to a New England haunted house? Yes, Carella does see ghosts. Oh, that's a spoiler, isn't it, if you haven't read it? Um, sorry. <laughs> Yet, it's a strange interlude. Carella and McBain are much more convincing on their big city turf. In the end, it's slogging police work that turns up the clues to the killer. Ghosts is middle-grade McBain, but far superior to last year's Calypso with its kinky sadism. Interesting. And who else have we got? We've got John Coleman in the thrillers column of the Sunday Times. A dab of diablerie behind the thick ear seems fashionable. Dot, 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 dot. The title's a good pun. Rational readers may resent the unmcbainish high spirits. Well, what did we think about it? You'll find out in a second when the main podcast starts. And please, please do tell us what you thought about it as well, if you haven't already. And once again, to everyone who contributes, thank you very much. It's great. Hope you're all keeping well. Enjoy the podcast. Hark! It's an 87th Precinct podcast. This is the only podcast in the world dedicated to Ed McBain's seminal series of police procedural novels, which began in 1956 with Cop Hater and ended in 2005 with Fiddlers. There were 55 books in the series, and today's podcast looks at book number 34, Ghosts. To review this book, I'm joined by two mysterious beings from another realm. Mr. Morgan, the headless spectre of the Northern Lakes, Brown. Hello. And Mr. Stephen Slimer Royston. Ooh. Uh, (laughs) My name is Paul Abbott, and I'm not a phantom, but I am that talking mongoose from the Usborne Book of Goosts. (laughs) Goosts? The (laughs) goose. It happened already. Is that that kind of like a Scottish ghost, is it? A goose? (laughs) A goose, yeah. The Usborne Book of Goosts. There's a lot of them about this goose. (laughs) Oh, well. Well, goose? Well, I I, I was expecting, you know, strange things in this uh, podcast, but not, not, Certainly not ghosts. <laughs> not this early. Early ghosts. Is that a ghost of a dead goose? I wonder. Maybe. <laughs> maybe we'll find out as we ghosts. go through. <laughs> but but we, like right ghost, we like ghostly uh, apparitions today, though, aren't we? We are a bit. Well, this this is entirely we're... appropriate. We're, we're in incorporeal, aren't we? We're disembodied. Mm. <laughs> see, I'm talking, but you can't see me. Well, that's probably normal for listening to a podcast, but not for the making of them. No, this no. is true. <laughs> like you say, it is appropriate that things are strange. and strange enough for me to invent ghosts, but because the book we're doing is quite strange, and it is all about ghosts. So I think we've reached 1980 with the 87th Precinct series. And I'll give you the quick rundown of the info. It comes out, this book comes out in Viking Press in 1980. It comes out in paperback in America in Bantam in 1981. It's Hamish Hamilton in the UK and Pan in the paperback edition in the UK. What does 1980 mean to you guys? 1980. Iron Maiden's first album came out in 1980. It did? Perhaps that's what it means to me. I don't know. Yeah, that's pretty good. What, what else? Do you know anything about who won the FA Cup in uh, 1980? 1980. Mm, no. <laughs> it was a bit of a, a down south affair. It was West Ham beat Arsenal. Oh, no. In a in a 1-0 thriller, I'm sure. Yeah, totally, um, f- t- totally forgettable final, it sounds like to me. Good yeah. year for Steve Harris from Iron Maiden, though, uh, being a massive uh, celebrity West Ham yeah, fan, though. That's oh, yeah, that's true, actually, first, yeah. yeah. God, yeah, first he must, he must have had a right year, yeah. He really must. <laughs> what about the Super Bowl? Now, Steve-O, you should know something about the Super Bowl result this year. Should I? Yeah. <laughs> Did the Steelers win their... Th- Fourth, they did. They became the first team to win four Super Bowls. Mm, there you go. Beat the, the LA right Rams. There, didn't they? Yeah, it wasn't bad. Beat the LA Rams thirty-one nineteen. 
a little bit of sport for people, seeing as there's no sport existing yeah. in the world anymore. That's the only know. sport that's existing at the moment is uh, Australian Rugby League, which has been played in empty stadiums in Australia. Blimey. Mm. Well, I had, I had a dream last night that, like, like for some reason they'd started playing rugby league again in this country and like everybody really got into it because it was the only <laughs> sport going. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, if, if they did that, then it probably would happen. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Another fact about 1980 then, Paul? I've got a good fact about a 1980 um, hovercraft fact. Oh, <laughs> I absolutely love hovercrafts. I must have well, told you that if I was like the lord of the world, I would reintroduce hovercrafts like immediately. <laughs> Would it be like day one in office, nine o'clock, yeah. hovercraft? Yeah, the Emergency Hovercraft Act. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, well, you know, stranger things could happen. I think <laughs> it still exists. You can go to the Isle of Wight on one, I think. Well, this is my hovercraft fact for everyone, mm. uh, which is that in 1980, the decision was taken to discontinue the Cows to Southampton hovercraft service. Oh, <laughs> is that what I just said exists? Oh, uh, well, no, not there. necessarily. It was discontinued due to rising costs and in- increased competition from hydrofoils and catamarans, apparently. Ooh, Lousy hydrofoils and catamarans. But they kept on with the ride to South Sea service, so. Yeah. I think the reason why go. they discontinued uh, hovercrafts were, yeah, was just purely the cost, I think. They were just too expensive. Yeah. For running these mad space fuel. vehicles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. There we go. Anyone who's come to this new will be absolutely baffled by our strange going straight into hovercraft stuff. Well, it's important. But it is. It's, it looms large in the legend of anyone who grew up in the 1980s where hovercrafts were still seem to be an exciting thing. Yep. The Vauxhall Astra was launched in March of 1980. Oh, right. Okay. That would have replaced the, uh, the Viva, the Vauxhall so. Viva. That a horizontal speedometer. Imagine such a, a horizontal thing. speedometer. Imagine such a thing like that. I can't. That's bad. Yeah, so it was just like a horizontal dial, like you were on a radio or something. <laughs> oh, I saw. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. That's very odd. There was more sport in 1980 because there was the Olympics. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they were held in Moscow, so there was loads of um, people boycotting it. Yeah, we did quite well in those, I think, because the Americans yeah, would turn up and the Canadians and some others. Yeah, although I believe Russia won overall, funnily well, enough. Surprisingly, yeah. My favourite fact, though, I've, I'm not going to go mad on the facts here so we can get into the book, but my favourite fact about 1980, 13th of September 1980, a bear called Hercules, which had gone missing on a Scottish island whilst filming a Kleenex advert, was found. <laughs> Wow. How on earth did they lose a bear? I don't know. Just Why was just... the bear endorsing Kleenex? I just don't well, understand. I... They've got those cartoon bears that anim- that they use for um, Charmin, haven't they? Maybe uh... did they switch to cartoon bears after the real ones proved to be prone to going missing on Scottish islands, I suppose. To be, perhaps, yeah. Perhaps it saw a ghost in the highlands. <laughs> Yeah, got I like this got Hercules and went to uh, a wall in the bush. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear me! But there you go. I believe that's probably the highlight of 1980. There, anyway. Um, and we'll come to some more musicy things when we do our bonus episode afterwards. But we'll, uh, yeah, I'll give you the McBain rundown as well. And the McBain rundown is that in 1980 he releases Ghosts, the book we're going to talk about, okay. and he does two short stories. One for Ellery Queen's mystery magazine called The Ringer, under the name John Abbott, Ooh. which he uses only for a couple of things he uses that one for. And a short story in the German edition of Playboy called Ein Fest vor Gauner, A <laughs> Feast for Crooks. That's just an Evan Hunter story. We've looked previously at the Czech TV adaptation of Doll, Panenka, which comes out in 1980. And also on Czech TV in 1980 is, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this properly, but Zungul Fed Tabuli, which is a adaptation of the Blackboard Jungle. I was, good. I was yeah. just going to say that. It sounds, sounds a bit jungly, doesn't it? Yeah. So one of his biggest, earliest books has uh, 
been adapted for TV in the Czech Republic, so or okay. Czechoslovakia rather, as it was at the time. And also in Japan, it's the start of the first big series based on the 87th Precinct books uh, since the one in America in the 60s, the one that they call Naked City. So they nick the name from a different TV cop show, mm-hmm. Naked City, and turn it into 87th Precinct, Naked City. And that starts in 1980 between April and October. And how many series did that, that did they do? They just did one series of 26 episodes. Ooh. I'd love to see it, but I can't get hold of it, can't even find a clip of it or anything. Oh, it's a shame. But, so essentially they adapt most of the books. Brilliant. Yeah. So there's a lot going on there on TV and in the print, bits and pieces. And let us get to Ghosts, which we were sort of, I think if anyone's been listening along to this, knows that we've been a bit sort of like, mm, what's going to happen when we get to <laughs> Ghosts? Have we all, we had all read it before, haven't we? Yes. So none of us come to this for, for the first time. No, nope, read it before. And I suppose it, the title tells you everything you need to know about this. <laughs> we, oh, I don't know. Should we just have a general uh, quick th- thought about this before we get stuck into the detail of it? <laughs> <laughs> what, are our, what are your general feelings without being too specific? Well, I, I read it back, and as I've mentioned on some of them, um, I could not remember the plot whatsoever reading it back until like uh-huh. right right at the end and when I suddenly kind of remembered where it was going, really. Um, yeah. But I think I kind of remembered, obviously, the themes of it, but it was uh, a lot less, less ridiculous than I uh, thought I remembered, if you see what I mean. I do. What about you, Morgan? Um, kind of uh, similar in, in the sense of um, I, I couldn't really remember what what went on plot wise until I was a good chunk of the way in. But I don't know if anything. I might have found it slightly more ridiculous than the Oof. first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think my opinion uh, tallies a bit more with Steve-O's, but when it does get ridiculous. It gets very ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, because I would say if you take away that one scene in the house, like fairly near the end, as, yeah. as far as like the non clairvoyant character, uh, well, not the clairvoyant, the uh, the um, the medium, the medium character, kind of not much of it's ridiculous, really. Yeah, no, it does. It, it, the ridiculousness does does just hinge on that one scene, doesn't it? Um, yeah, uh, and it kind of goes as quickly as it starts, if you see what I mean. But uh, yeah, because I was reading it and I was thinking, oh, what happens in this? And I was thinking, oh, this is the one. There's no resolution. You know, the the crimes are total mystery because of these ghosts, and yet, obviously, that 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 it is not the case whatsoever. It's a very <laughs> yeah. real crime committed by a. Uh, a real person. Uh, yeah, so, there's plenty of spookery en route. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great phrase and very appropriate. Yeah, I, so it's clear, presumably, if you've not read this book, if you've not read it, then why are you listening to this, you maniac? But <laughs> it is the 87th Precinct. Everything's as normal, except for the fact that there are some ghosts. Ever so briefly, but there's also a load of spooky medium stuff going on as well. But that's more easily explained away. Mm-hmm. You can sort of justify that when the actual ghosts turn up is where I have a problem with this book. Yes. Which is annoying because, if anything, I enjoyed reading it again a great deal up until that point because it's got some, I think, some of the best bits of 87th Precinct stuff we've had for a little while. Yeah, I'd agree there. Yeah, Yeah, there there is some excellent stuff in there, absolutely, but uh, that bit does kind of sink the ship, I think. (laughs) Yeah. But but then again, if you believed in ghosts, you would think that, uh, you wouldn't think that, would you? Well, I suppose well, not. I mean, as we've found, I think there are quite a few people who have this as one of their favourites, if not their f- actual favourite eight seven three sync novel, aren't there? Yeah, definitely, including Stephen King. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, if anyone's going to have it as their favourite, it probably would be Stephen King, wouldn't it? And I think it's his shadow sort of falls over this book somewhat. Mm. I think I think McBain has said, I was trying to prove to Stephen King that I could do it too. 
And I did find a, a little interview with uh, Evan Hunter from a magazine called Contemporary Authors, which was like a, a roundup of loads of working authors. And this one happened to have an interview with him in. And they asked him the question, you recently touched on the occult in your fiction in Ghosts. Are there other new areas you plan to explore in forthcoming work? And he says, in the 87th Precinct series, I can explore anything, anytime. I wasn't trying to cash in on the occult field. I just thought it would be an interesting case if the cops came up with something that looked like a ghost had done it, and if they really did meet some ghosts along the way. But no, I wouldn't wander off into the occult per se ever again, I don't think. Mm. So... (laughs) <laughs> it's a one-time experiment. Morgan Ooh. sounds Morgan sounds very uh, unconvinced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's something that he he has every right to um, to pursue and to you know to, to do in his fiction. It would have been perhaps nice if he pursued it in a standalone book rather than slap bang in the middle of a an established series but uh yeah i don't know why he didn't just write a, a standalone book to to try and show off to stephen king i don't, I just don't know <laughs> but yeah so anyway it's an interesting point people were asking him about it at the time mm. is is it's interesting there anyway <laughs> let's get stuck into some of what goes along in here and we open basically with a, a body in the snow so it's a it's a winter book a very cold christmas book almost mm-hmm. Uh, Monaghan and Munro and Cotton Hawes has a little bit more to do in this book, which is quite nice. And they're looking at one body, and while they're there, they find that there's another body up in this apartment block. We hit the ground with a load of corpses very quickly. Before long, we meet, and this is still in Chapter 1, we meet the medium, which is a lady called Hilary Scott, who looks exactly like Teddy Carella. <laughs> which, again, I don't know why he's done this, but it's... Yeah, that, that's, that is like totally unexplained, isn't it, really? Is it yeah. just to add to the general weirdness of the the whole thing? There doesn't seem to be any particular dramatic need for it to be a thing, does there? Particularly given that she then also ends Has up it? having a an identical... It's just... Uh, Twin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah I don't, don't really know why, but uh, there we go. Yeah, there doesn't seem yeah. to be any... Yeah, it must just be to add to the general... It can, so, maybe it's kind of the explanation that kind of throws it's thrown uh, Carella off his normal whatever yeah. it's you know what I mean it's to heighten the uh, temptation to Carella isn't mm-hmm. it yeah in that it, things aren't quite real or as they seem or yeah mm-hmm. yeah but anyway, we've got a female corpse outside this building who's been stabbed once. And inside the building, we've got the author of a book about ghosts who's been stabbed many, many times. Mm-hmm. And this is a, a point at which one of the big books that had come out and therefore the movies was the Amityville Horror, yeah. which I've never read the book of. Nor have I, actually. Um, seen certainly the the original 70s, well, I guess 1980 film, was it? Around there, anyway. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, ne- never, that, yeah. never read the book uh, by Jay Anson. So what do we know about the Amityville Horror? Because I reckon that's the other big long shadow over this, yeah, other than Stephen King. I think, well, I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely right, yeah. So the, the book came out in 1979, so that would very much be casting its shadow over this, you'd imagine. I did have a little look. So theoretically based on, on a true story, as so many of these things are, the, the, the true bit of it certainly is that um, in 1974, uh, a gen- uh, I was going to say a gentleman, no, no gentleman, <laughs> a, a man called uh, Ronald Defoe Jr. Um, killed his family uh, in a, in 112 Ocean Avenue in uh, the Amityville neighbourhood of Long Island. Yeah. Um, so that's the actual hor- horrifying bit, obviously. Um, and the the house after this, uh, while the guy was awaiting trial, went on the market. Um, at obviously a bargain price. The people buying the house knew what had occurred there. So uh, George and Kathy Lutz um, took the house um, and, and moved in in December 1975, only to, to leave again after 28 days, um, having been apparently sort of forced out by all this um, alleged paranormal activity that was going on in there. Yeah. And the, the book obviously details in... Uh, 
in, in fairly lurid terms, uh, what was supposed to be going on there. They uh, had a priest round to bless the house who was told by some spooky voice to get out, and then he developed uh, blisters on his palms that were like stigmata, and there was ectoplasm dripping from the ceiling and swarms of insects and cloven hoof prints in the snow outside the house, doors slamming um, of the, their own accord, all this stuff. Uh, so all of that was meant to be going on. Um, naturally, yeah. uh, in the years after the book came out and the film and everything, most of this was um, largely proven to be a massive hoax, obviously. Yes. Uh, I think that actually the, the, the murderer's defense lawyer apparently cooked up most of it, um, in in his words, over many bottles of wine with the Lutzes. Um, partly yeah. as a way of uh, th- 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 he could bring it up in the trial so that uh, Mr. Defoe could claim that this had sent him crazy. Um, and also they all, all made a lot of money off it. It's uh, a bit alarming. And it, you know, basically the whole story fell apart um, over the years. Although I think. George Lutz continued to claim that it was mostly based in, in truth, even after everything had been disproved or refuted uh, fairly convincingly. But uh, yeah, a, a bit of an odd one and definitely uh, something that would have influenced this book. Yeah, so the idea of a writer who's written a book about ghosts based on a house in a place. I mean, but in yeah, the, certainly. E- echoing the, this plot, though, didn't that Anson guy, uh, he basically did the uh, the text based on some tapes that the uh, the family had recorded, hadn't didn't he? That that would definitely make sense, yeah. yeah. And, and added lots of his own details, and uh, I think basically it ended up with everyone suing each other, and so again, sort of um, reverberates a bit with with uh, what goes on in, in in the novel too. So it's interesting, and we find out that this book in in Ghosts, which is called Deadly Shades, is being adapted into a film. So that's similar as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been filmed in Wales. He makes a point of yeah. saying, "Improbably in Wales or something." <laughs> yeah. So then it gets into the, the the chase down to see who killed these two people, and they focus their attention. And it's quite an interesting point. They focus their attention on the famous person, the famous author, even though they have no idea who he is, and <laughs> that obviously gets them in trouble with the, the husband of the woman who's been killed because he's like, "Well, why?" Why aren't you looking at her? And it's yeah, they get told off properly. Yeah, they don't go and see him for ages, do they? <laughs> so you, you but then, look. yeah, once they do go and see him, they find out that he's uh, been a wife beater. So that it's it's a uh, it's a tricky situation. Hmm. Yeah, they, they, I mean, with some sort of um, justification, they assume that um, that the the woman on the streets murder has been sort of is sort of related to, to the first murder and that it's it's been committed by someone escaping the scene of the first murder. And, and uh, so th- there is a logic to the way they're proceeding with it, isn't there? But obviously yeah. the, 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 the husband doesn't necessarily see it that way. Yeah, de- yeah, definitely. But basically now Corella's hooked up with this this medium, Hilary Scott, and she basically just spends the rest of the book dragging him around. <laughs> yeah. she? So, like, come here, go there, do this. They're ch- they chase, chasing the flux around, aren't they? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It's following the flux. But she knows, like, details of interviews he's had with other people and stuff that things have been said to him. Uh, yeah. So, which you've just got to accept, haven't you, in order to, you know... To get through the story. Get through yeah. the story. <laughs> if you think that's ridiculous, you wouldn't last more than a chapter or two i don't think <laughs> yeah i mean the, 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 to some extent corella's sort of thinking to himself all the way along oh well you, you know these things can be explained away by this or and obviously as we know there, there are professional mediums who are experts at sort of cold readings of people and have ways of finding out information and, and making it seem like they've just plugged it from thin air so i don't know it, up to, to a certain point um it still allows room for you to be a skeptic which you know, it would have been nice if it had continued to to do so. Really, yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> but anyway, they discover that this guy, this author, has not just been stabbed. There's been a big robbery of jewellery from his flat. So they think, well, this can't be ghosts. This is literally just someone's nicking. You know, it's a a, ro- a burglary gone wrong. Except that they've shared a a, a drink together. It seems. Mm. 
Yeah, the the one weird thing about their their investigation, they, they they seem to accept it's a burglary, and yet they don't seem to put much on the fact that this guy had been stabbed about twenty times in clearly a yeah. frenzied attack that would be so um you know inconsistent with a burglary. Uh, yeah. And yet that doesn't get any kind of traction in in the book whatsoever, which I thought was a bit yeah. odd. Yeah, there's not much on the forensics side in this, really, is there? No. There's, there's a little bit of like the, the wounds chart, which runs down how often, how he was stabbed, and where, and how many no. times. That's it. That's quite early on, but there's not much from there on in. Yeah, because the, really. attack, the attack's so frenzied, and yeah, and yet... nineteen flash and stab wounds. It does sound fairly uh, frantic, yeah. And yet they don't really seem to focus on that whatsoever, from what yeah. I remember. Anyway, Corella's association with Hilary Scott leads to her telling him that she's... F- something about water. She thinks something about water, and she's holding his hands, and then she kisses him, uh, which is like this thing that sends Corella bonkers. He, he <laughs> has to tell... He tells Teddy that evening, which she does not take well. <laughs> Um, and there's quite a lot of the Corellas at home, or rather, there's a lot of the Corellas home because they get tr- the, the family gets trapped in town when Corellas back at the house and stuff like that. Um, we get a, a reference to Long Time No See from two books before, when um, it refers to the fact that he hasn't got that dog that was in Long Time No See that we thought he was going to adopt. Mm-hmm. His, his housekeeper Fanny has forbid him to uh, keep it, <laughs> so that's just written out of the story straight away. Yeah, there's, there's a lot about working over the holidays, the police procedural aspect of, of shifts and who gets holidays because Hanukkah and Christmas fall on the same day that year as well. Hey, hey the detective squad's grown. He says it's got 18 detectives in this book and yet it only ever is 16 previously, I'm sure. Mm. Well, we get some character debuts in this, we don't do. we? We do, yeah, we do. There's a chapter in this, chapter six. So whilst all the investigation starting into the specific main cases of this, we have the, one of those brilliant chapters, which is a montage of working over Christmas for the police, yeah. which is my, one of my favourite chapters of any 87th Precinct book. But it introduces Pee Wee Wizonski and Lou Moskowitz. So there's two new detectives on the squad. Perhaps they're the 17th and 18th then. Yeah. And we get someone else later on as well who will be making re- return appearances. But, of course, Maya Maya, who has to swap a day with Corella so he can do this investigation, comes into work and gets put with Bob O'Brien to go out on a on a squeal. Uh-uh. And guess what happens? <laughs> Shooting. Yeah, O'Brien does the right thing, as, you, as he always has done, which is draw his gun to, to kill someone who's going <laughs> to... or to shoot someone who's going to attempt to kill them. But uh, Maya Maya's come into work and then got... Shot in the leg. So Corella's ostensibly put him in hospital. Mm. He feels guilty and then takes him some booze in hospital later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he does a fair amount of drinking in this book, Corella, doesn't he? He does, which is, a, a, again, another bit of a strange one, because he's never really quite so keen on to get onto the scotch when he's not at home, but he does it a couple of times in this book. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, nice squad dream scene in, in Chapter 6, really, and uh, out on the streets with all the various terrifying Christmas crimes. <laughs> oh, yeah, and a team of six men who steal all the cobblestones from a street. <laughs> <laughs> that's the comedy crime for this book. Anyway, let's say, where do we get to? We've got a an agent, an author, an author's agent that they go and visit. He ends up getting stabbed. Well, the per- the person who, uh, shortly before the... It's probably worth mentioning the... Uh, the author gets killed. There's the only person who comes into the building is somebody who's given the name of of his uh, agent, isn't it? The description matches this agent as well. Yeah, yeah. So he kind of becomes a bit of a suspect for a while. Yeah. Until and so they they have quite a bit of effort to establish his alibi, don't they? Involving going to talk to an off duty, uh, a guy who's a, like a, a reserve fireman who's also a bartender that yeah. you have to go and find to, and who tells a really long, complicated story <laughs> about a woman taking a top off in the bar, which yeah. is just quite a good story. Yeah, I have to get all the way to the end of the story in order for him to just remember the one bit of information that he was asked for in the first place. Yeah, it's it's a good uh, it's a good McBain character. Yeah, that's a nice little set piece. 
But once they've established his alibi, they get back to find him dead anyway, so... Yep. And th- thanks to a convenient homophobe, they discover that he's gay and he's keeping company with uh, another man, as well as this woman who'd apparently propositioned. There's all that stuff going on. And someone also then tries to stab the twin sister of the medium, who is a twin, so they think it's her. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's all getting very stabby. It's, it's heavily stabby, this story. Yeah. Then we get to the weird bit, which is basically where... Hilary Scott drags Corella off to Massachusetts <laughs> to go and look at a place where the author's original wife died. So it's it's a ludicrously convoluted set of circumstances. And Corella sort of spirals down into investigating a crime that he's got nothing to do with and no evidence for, <laughs> which is a bit odd. But it's, uh, well, that's, yeah, it's just the, the water, isn't it, that, that sends yeah. them off there? Yeah, um, yeah, sort of, um, yeah, these trances that she keeps lapsing into, for some reason convincing that he needs to go on this trip to Massachusetts. And, uh, and of course, the weather means that they get trapped there and they have to find a place together and stuff like that. But she's insistent on going and finding this the place where the author's original wife died, and then looking at this house, which is apparently the book's about, but it's not, then finding another house, which ends up being the house in chapter 10, which we'll get to in a second. Along the way, they somehow conveniently find that the person who typed up the report of the original wife's death also transcribed some tapes for the author. (laughs) There's the thing of the tape reference coming back in. Yeah. And that's their biggest uh, clue, isn't it? Because this, this person on the tape has got this hoarse, hoarse, rasping voice and it, it kind of dawns yeah. on them that it's not the author. Not, so the author's yeah. kind of written up, uh, taken from another source that they don't really know, but this this rasping voice on these tapes. And, and yeah. I think it's at that point that Corella starts to put together a little bit of a kind of a chain of events maybe yeah he has he has a name related to someone who leased a house that related to the where this person was and they got the tapes which account for a certain amount of the book something like that and but then we get chapter 10 which is what we've really been building up to <laughs> which which in the middle of this this Christmas period, they're man- where they're, everything's blocked off and snowy, they manage to track down an estate agent who just gives them a key to go to a house. <laughs> and, well, what happens in Chapter 10 once they're there? What happens? Well, some old women turn up, don't they? <laughs> Chuntering. Uh, is there a child with a bouncing ball in the attic? Something like that? Yeah. So on my notes that I've written down here, I've got in big, bold letters, then they see an actual ghost, then four more ghosts, yeah. and a ghost of a little girl. So they see seven ghosts. Yeah. Four, five, that's six ghosts, ignore me. Six ghosts, which causes the medium to faint, rubbish medium. Yeah, so Corella basically you know, yeah, gets all these yeah. ghosts, doesn't uh, he? Yeah, she faints and pees herself, and then... Uh... Corella gets his pistol out, doesn't he? As he's going to shoot these and girls. He shoots some ghosts, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's wonderful. And he has to carry her out of this house and back to their hotel. He's got a name by this point, anyway. Somehow, despite all this ghost stuff, he gets back to the hotel and talks to Cotton Hawes on the phone and and gives him a name of someone that they that might be a suspect. Well, like that, they get the hotel, doesn't he? Say somebody like Calvin Horse has called him something like <laughs> yes. that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought this was quite funny. The night clerk handed him a message over the desk. It read, Calvin Horse called. Oh, I remember you to call it him well. at home. <laughs> he got it perfectly right. <laughs> Mr. Horse. He debated greeting him as Mr. Horse, but that was in no mood for squadron humour. <laughs> yeah. Of course, Hilary Scott, the medium, tries to get to Corella to sleep with her. Yeah, well, she's very frightened, isn't she? Well, yeah, and the only way to do that is to have uh, sex, apparently. Well, yeah, definitely, obviously. And so, and so upset is she that he he turned her down. That she possibly visits him in the night anyway, but he's not sure if it's her or another ghost. <sighs> Basically, he gets a Ghostbusters style spooky blowjob. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
it's, it's the if that it actually happened and he didn't dream it, it's the weirdest thing that's happened in these books completely. Mm-hmm. Anyway, even as a real thing to happen to Corella, it's not like he's tied up and it's it's mm-hmm. just like he has been in the past. But it's just it's odd. Oh, oh, it's odd. Yeah. But then we get towards the end. He gets back to the city, and we have a, a single chapter to finish the book off. So you've had nine chapters, of which I would say are all really good. You've got yeah. chapter ten, which is, and apologies for swearing, batshit mental. <laughs> and then you have one chapter to to wrap it up. <laughs> Where we get a new hero. We do, yeah. So it's a stakeout situation. So the only real thing they've got to go on is someone trying to pawn this jewellery. So they have to do a stakeout, and they don't have enough men. <laughs> So their stakeout is absolutely a washout because the, the guy who catches him is a patrolman who, who sees someone running out of a pawn shop that, that isn't being staked out. Mm-hmm. Stuck out? <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's Takashi Fujiwara. Yeah. Who we will be hearing more about in, in books to come. Excellent. Good old Indeed will. And it turns out it's the guy whose voice was on the tape and he was just, he was ripped off. Because he had a contract and his contract was lost in the fire and the guy was a, a bit of a baddie anyway by not giving him any royalties. Yeah, trying to pass off uh, the, the guy's story as his own. So effectively, the, uh, I suppose that the murderer is, it could be, yeah, could be said to be the ghostwriter, hence doing it, giving the title a bit of a McBain-style double kind of meaning. Yeah. yeah, um, Which I assume is intentional. Yeah. The other thing we've not mentioned is the demise of the writer's wife back in uh, the place where this cabin is, uh, which who drowned despite being a very good swimmer from like three or four years before. Yeah, um, and that's that's the unsolved crime that Corella has no business to try to solve. Yeah, but gets kind of fairly significantly sidetracked by. Uh... Well, the only person who says that it wasn't an accident is the medium. Uh, yeah. And the only slight thing that corroborates that is they go to the house where he used to live and find some diving equipment still there. Yeah, um, which seems fairly unlikely given it was supposed to be like three or four years before, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but the fact that you know he's turned out to be a total git over this book, you're kind of left yeah. wondering, actually, you know. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I suppose if you wanted to, you could... If you try to put a logical head on this, uh, you could try and square a load of this stuff, like the spooky stuff, with that sort of side of it as well, if you wanted to. But you can't square the ghosts. That's the problem. No. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe this medium had just sent Corella a bit balmy by looking like his wife. Who knows? I don't know. Hey, they drink. They do have a drink before they see the ghosts, so they, don't they? They so do, they're yeah. From, from a bottle of scotch that just happens to be there. Just yeah. sit, sitting there in the house, you just part part drunk bottle of scotch. You just died. So who knows what was in that? That's it. That's how we can. That's perfect. We can. I I can accept that. I'll I'll write myself a little sub chapter. Yeah. <laughs> to to explain that, and I'll just slide it in the book. Yeah. Just sneaks there in advance and drops a load of mescaline into the scotch, and uh, that that's why it all happens. Yeah. Exactly that. There we go. That's the Hunter S. Thompson chapter. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just well, just before we sort of do a summing up anyway with this, I will say there's some nice references back. So like I said, there's a reference to Long Time No See when they talk about the dog not being there anymore. There's also a reference back to Cop Hater yeah, and mm-hmm. a reference to Give the Boys a Great Big Hand as well. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The, the other time that he was terrified to death or something. Yeah, and there's also a reference to him, Corella, having to shoot a, a slobbering axe maniac, which I thought was axe, but actually isn't that. It's a separate one that doesn't, it's not in the stories anyway. So untold stories of the 87th precinct. Perhaps uh, Ed McBain thought that's what happened in axe. (laughs) Put it in. (laughs) He may have looked up and thought, oh, axe. Oh, that was one with an axe maniac. Can I write that? Yeah, probably. Probably, probably attacked Corella. Yeah. Probably had to shoot him. So I think we better get into a summing up of the book. Well, are we summing up? And, are we summing up and scoring at the same yes, time? Summing up and scoring. I think, so I think wanna... Morgan needs to go first. He's got oh, very okay. strong opinions on this. Okay. Well, yeah, do it, Morgan. Then. Yeah, it's a funny one. I, I I hadn't remembered being as sort of outraged by how daft this book was from my first reading, but maybe because I guess when I initially read it, I, had, I wasn't quite so immersed in the in the series as a whole. But um, now on a second reading, the 
I, I, there's a lot to enjoy in those first nine chapters. There really is, but like, yeah. some of, I, I, it really annoys me that uh, Bain actually chose to experiment that much with this excellent established series and then it makes me a bit of a hypocrite because i've kind of applauded him messing with the format previously and i like that there is that freedom for him to try different things but this just seems like a stretch too far really undermining the kind of fundamental reality of of um of the series really so i don't know it's 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 a, a definite low point for me um mm. and as such even though there is a lot to enjoy there I am going to go for a score of 50 police shields. Oh, 50 police shields. Oh, blimey. Well, Steve, what's your thought? Yeah, you see, yeah, I don't know. I must have thought this was really ridiculous because when <laughs> reading it back, I didn't think it was quite as ridiculous as I thought. It, as I said at the beginning, I thought that... They never found out what did it, and the crime was totally unexplained, and you end up finishing the book thinking, well, that's the biggest load of nonsense ever. But mm. if you kind of take the really daft scene out of it, uh, yeah, I very much enjoyed it. But, yeah, it is very, very silly, that. And But perhaps he was just in, in, being poisoned by some whiskey in a cup. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't go <laughs> drinking whiskey out of a cupboard in a house that had been occupied for years a house no less that had been moved from another part of the United States as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was equally balmy so yeah yeah it's a funny one really isn't it and I, I think my score has got to reflect that yeah 60 I'll go 60 maybe 60 police shields Okay, and well, sixty was my was going to be my score as well, and I, like I said earlier, I I tend to agree with you, Steve-O, But I do, I mean, chapter six of this book is absolutely one of my all time favourites of the eighty seventh precinct sketches of of life in the precinct, mm -hmm. uh, and it it reads so much like an episode of Hill Street Blues, which starts the following year, <laughs> which, so it's which is an interesting thing. And I just wish, I really, yeah. Oh, why does it have to be ghosts? <laughs> I like ghost stories well enough. That's fine, but it's yeah. I'm putting in sixty police shields, and of course that gives us with a patented rounding down system <laughs> <laughs> fifty six police shields for ghosts. And I think we're going to get some pushback from people on this who are going to disagree with us vehemently. Which is fair enough, as is their right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have the absolute right to be wrong if they wish. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Okie doke. Well, we'll take a little break in a second and then we'll record our bonus episode. Not that people listening to this need to know we're going to take a little break, but we will. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back for that. So look out for that when that comes out. And the next book in the series that we'll be looking at, we get stuck right into the a bit more of a gritty side of of the city with heat the next book is heat now you're talking yeah i'm looking forward to these next few books yeah me too until that time i'm going to say goodbye and i'm going to ask steve-o to say goodbye Ooh. oh he's turned into a goose <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and morgan <laughs> bye, bye. 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 bye.